Welcome in to Rounding the Bases, the podcast about culture and leadership with a baseball twist presented by Community America Credit Union. My name is Joel Goldberg. We've got a really impactful episode today and you know, not really by design, uh, somewhat by accident, I guess I could say that I've had a, a lot of episodes lately in some form or another that have touched on mental health. And I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm excited about that. Because if mental health hasn't touched your life or someone close to you in your life or, or someone at work, then you just don't know about it. Everybody's experiencing stuff. And that's been going on a long time, even more so because of the pandemic, social media, on and on. We could talk about that. And recently, I had John Buck on, former major league catcher who lives in Utah now. And, and here's a guy that was running the show and you know talked very much about his mental health and and, and a lot of what he dealt with. And so I, I always find it really important when you can get people to open up about this that are leaders, that are perceived as being cream of the crop, as, as good as it gets, as tough as they come. And that's my guest today. Uh, and, and there's, of course, a, a greater description. So I'll, I'll give you this one to start. Elliot Marshall is a martial artist, business owner, podcaster, author. He was the first American to win the BJJ Pan American Championship at Blue, Purple, and Brown Belt. After transitioning to MMA, Elliot fought on the Ultimate Fighter, earned a UFC contract, fought four more years. And then upon retirement, he became the co-owner of Easton Training Center, one of Colorado's leading martial arts schools. They've got seven locations across the Denver area. And along with that, uh, his platform includes a podcast, a book called The Gospel of Fire. He's had a TED Talk. He's involved in social media, of course, um, and he's helping others realize that they have the power to do and be whatever they want. Now, despite all of that success, so here's that perceived tough guy, right? I mean, if you have all those accolades and accomplishments, uh, you're tough. But that doesn't mean that you're immune from mental health. In 2015, Elliot suffered severe anxiety, depression, insomnia. With the help of family and friends, he overcame his anxiety and now is helping others that are in that same situation. He also started fighting again in 2016 and donated his entire purse to help Easton students who might be struggling. So that is Elliot in a nutshell. I'm sure I'm missing some things. I might even have some things wrong, but we can clarify all of that. Good to be joined right now by Elliot Marshall, E-L-I-O-T. So lose the yes. extra L, lose the extra T. Yes. Elliot, so good to have you on here. Did, did I get most of that right? Man, what else do you want to talk about? You, you nailed it. So what, Okay, what, we're done. You the can, weather's you can go nice, now. right? It's a nice day here in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, I wanted to set all that up. And, and yeah. for people that are listening, <laughs> most listen to this podcast, just, just go check out ElliotMarshall.com, E-L-I-O-T-M-A-O. R-S-H-A-L-L.com. It's in the yes, show sir. notes. And you'll see a dude that looks like you would expect, a tough guy. Yeah. And that that's great. I mean, I know you, Good for you me, have right? to yeah. work hard to accomplish all of that. Uh, that yeah. that comes with a lot of discipline and all the things that, that I wish that, that I was better at. That doesn't mean you had it all figured out. That doesn't mean that you're immune from so much of what we deal with. So let's talk about that. I mean, we'll get into how you got there, but sure. just because you're a tough guy doesn't mean that Every situation is easy, right? No, the situations have always been very hard for me in my life. They've, they've, you know, this, um, it, it's never been a, my, my mental health has never been an easy thing. And, you know, I was born in the eight, I was born in 1980 and mental health wasn't a thing, right? Like when we were younger, like there was no mental, what do you mean mental health? Like what's, what's that? And now it's something for me that I, I work on every day. Like, so it's, uh. I probably take care of my mental health as much, if not more, than I take care of my physical health. So it, my day starts and ends every every day, starts and ends with mental health. I, I want to delve into that in a little yeah. bit. But, you know, I, I want to ask you this question because I, I love, you know, my my assistant and my team, they send out questionnaires. And, and you you had an answer that I thought was interesting. It was something along the lines of, you know, we always ask, is there something you want to promote? And you said, not, you know, not really. I just mm -hmm. want to talk about all of this. And and that to me tells me that that this is a guy with a purpose. Like, I mean, you can promote your podcast and I will. Uh, we can promote your book. Uh, for those that can't see that are listening, he's shaking his head like, no, you don't need to. But I, I will because I think that those are ways for people to connect and understand your story and ultimately, you know, help them. But but to me, this sounds like a guy that has a much deeper purpose in life, perhaps one that you didn't know when all this started. No, I didn't know it at all. 
right? Like I didn't know it at all. I thought my passion was martial arts. I thought, you know, that's what I, you know, I do martial arts for my whole life. And, and yeah, that was a passion. Um, but with my breakdown, what, what I, what got me out was other people, right? What got me out was my, was a, was a tribe that I had made, you know, that I had helped co- uh, cultivate with the schools. Um, a couple really, really close friends that, that, um, during that, during the initial month of my breakdown slash spiritual awakening, I like to call it that stayed on the phone with me all night. Like I, I would call them, like I would take my sleeping pills because I was, I had sleeping pills. Um, I would want them to work in five minutes. They wouldn't work. I'd have a panic attack. I'd run downstairs to my basement and I'd call one of my, one of these three friends and they, sometimes they would be on the phone with me for two hours and then I would fall asleep sometimes 30 minutes and I would fall asleep and sometimes all night. <clears throat> And also at the same time, I, I was still teaching and my students saved my life just by showing up, mm-hmm. right? Just by like being there when, when I needed someone or ev- people to be there, you know? So I realized that we are the way, each other, me, you, um, I, I don't have anything more important. And I know I told you I have to go at 11, right? Like, or in an hour. Um, but right now in this moment, I have nothing more important to do than talk to you. Like this, yeah. this is the most important thing in my life because we're in this together right now. So, um, my purpose in life is to empower other people, you know, to give people the idea and un- have them understand that you can do anything you fucking want with your life, like mm-hmm. anything. Um, and I'm a weirdo, right? There, there's not many like me. My dad's black and my mom is white and her grandparents were Holocaust survivors, survived the concentration camp. So wow. there's not many half black Jews in the world, half black, half Jews that aren't really Jewish or black or whatever, right? Like it's me and my sister and not many other of us. Um, but it doesn't, mm, and I, I, I never want to say that it's not, if that it's a fair world. Because the world, I, w- I won't say is fair, but God damn it, don't listen to that shit that you can't do it because you can do it. Will it be easy? No. Will it be equitable? No. But if you want it bad enough, you can do it. And that's what I want everyone to realize. And man, when you said, when you, when you talked about like promoting things, man, you, you promote um, power for somebody else. That's what I promote. That's all I want to promote. And if you want to give me a follow on social media, man, that'd be great. If you want to go and do all the other stuff, I thank you so much. Um, but it's not why I'm doing any of this. Like I'd be doing it anyway, even if there was nothing in it. Well, if, if anyone wants to follow Elliot on Instagram, I'll give it to you. <laughs> Fire Marshall 205. Look, this is what I do in life. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate live in a world it. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when, you, when you've been in television for 26 years and you're doing pre and post game shows, you got to move from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes they're smooth and sometimes they're not. And sometimes you screw them up, whatever. But what I'm hearing here is just this deeper level of understanding. I mean, you just covered a lot of ground in the last two minutes Mm -hmm. when you're dropping, okay, uh, mixed race, background that includes Holocaust. I mean, you're, and and I bring that up because I I think, and I don't know if you grasped all that identity growing up or if it was a process. Because you are, and we all are, like I'm in a different place today than I was 10 years, right. 20 years, 30 years ago. Um, thankfully, I, I haven't dealt with as much as you have dealt with, but I have with loved ones. So I certainly, it, it's not a foreign thing to me, but there's a beauty. And, and you know, I've never heard anybody say it like this, that this is the most important moment right now. There's a beauty in that focus of, of discovery, I think, which yeah. it seems like you have found but yet I'm guessing that's an ongoing, an ongoing piece of discovery. Yeah. It's an ongoing piece of discovery. Um, you know, the river's the same, but you're never standing in the exact same water, right? It, it changes as, as it flows down, down, downstream. So, um, you know, it's still whatever, you know, the name of the river is still the same, but it's not the same. So it's a duality. Um, one of the things when you, when you talk about this discovery, I guess, uh, I had to get really clear for myself, on what does it mean to be Elliot? You know, like who is Elliot? And and these questions that that question is it was became very very important to me. Um, and my answers 
allowed me uh, to do a couple of things. First, you know, um, and I talk about it all the time. I have two posters hanging behind me in my office here, and I and I have them there on purpose. Um, here, I'll try to tilt the screen maybe a little bit. The first one is Martin Luther King. You know, um, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only love can do that. Only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I got to love myself first and foremost. So how do I love myself? What does it mean to love Elliot? Well, if you want to love Elliot, you got to know who Elliot is. Who is Elliot? I'm a father. I'm a teacher. I'm a student. I'm a fighter and I'm a survivor. All of those things together make me enough. Okay. Now my question back, you know, in, in, in the discovery of these things uh, for me was they can't be changeable, right? They can't, they, you know, I, I like to say um, they're unfuckable with in the sense that is that no a matter word? fuckable? I think so. Unfucker, unfuckable. Unfuckable. Well, it's mine. Um, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll call Webster. And, every, and, and everybody understands what it means. So. Yeah. Um, no matter what event happens in my life, it doesn't change those things. If I made a million dollars, if I made a million dollars right now, somebody just came and put a million bucks on my desk, which one of those things would change? If that's who I am, if that's how I define myself, none of them, right? If I lost a million dollars, which one of those things would change? Not like you cannot, the only thing that's fuckable with is when I die, I won't be a survivor anymore. I'll be dead. So, um, but outside of that, we're done. Okay. And that leads me to the second quote. It's the Teddy Roosevelt quote, the man in the arena. It allows me to keep entering the arena. It doesn't matter the arena. I, I can go in there and I can do really, really well. And man, good for me. Or I can go in there and do really, really poorly. Okay, cool. It happens. But now I just get to take those things as information. It just becomes, okay, Elliot, that was skillful. Keep doing that. Maybe make this little adjustment. Elliot, that wasn't skillful. Okay, don't do that again, right? Don't don't do that. But it doesn't doesn't mess, doesn't fuck with the human that is Elliot. So therefore, the failures, the successes, cool, cool. It it doesn't touch the soul. So there's such a deep perspective there yeah. that applies to everyone. I, I mean, one of the things that I want to make clear to everybody, I mean, I didn't say it, but I, it should be obvious, is that you don't have to be an MMA fighter. You don't, I mean, look, you can, you can motivate anybody to, to get in there and fight and train and, and everything that goes with that. And that's a, that's a special breed of person and, and people that aren't exempt from mental health. I think the greater lesson here, and you're talking a lot about being in the moment and yeah. um, performance mindset is this applies to anybody in any walk of life. I mean, it could be the highest level CEO running a, you know, multi-billion dollar corporation to the startup entrepreneur that's just beginning today. And they're, they all, not all, but most of them have fear, some kind of fear, right? I mean, this is, this is, I hope you do. I hope you have fear. I, I, I hope you're afraid. Because then that's the only way that you can actually be courageous. If you're not afraid, then courage can't exist. Because it, you know, like there's, there's, if there's no fear, then there's, there's no bravery. We all like they both have to be sitting right here, you know, like right next to each other. I was, you know, one of my fighters just fought last weekend, and I had to read this book, and it's called uh, Zen and the Samurai. It's about Zen Buddhism and and fighting, <laughs> you know, samurais, and it tells a story. In chapter three, actually, I, I've read the story so much. It's chapter three, minute 23, and it's, the story starts at second 31. So 23, 31, chapter three. Um, you're the, the, he's talking about a bullfighter and a bull. And the place where the greatness lies is the place where you can kill the bull and the bull can kill you. You, ha you have to be sitting in that spot. So that you are as vulnerable as possible, and that is what will make you as strong as possible. Think about all of the things that came, uh, all of the things that you cherish in your life, every single one of them. It's because it was very hard. Okay, it was very, very difficult to achieve. Whether it's your marriage, okay, whether it's your children, that like. I don't love my wife, for example, because of all the great times we've had. I've had great times with so many people, right? Like so many people, the, the, 
the bond between us is because we've dealt with so much shit, literally with our kids shitting all over us, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and figuratively, like so much shit, so much difficulty, so much, God, is this for me? All, all of it. And, we, and you make it through. And you make it through that, that is why that that's where we, why we cherish everything. If it comes to you tomorrow, you'll, you know, you'll throw it away in a, in a hot second too. There was no work in that. Too easy, too easy, too easy, right? You see it all the time. You're baseball, right? You see all these, you see young kids that are just talented, right? And then all of a sudden they get to a spot where everyone's talented. That's right. And then, and then what? The greatest athlete of all time, Michael Jordan, he, right? He, he doesn't have the greatest athletic ability of all time. Like th- there are greater athletes than him, jump higher, run faster. What separated him? Work. Work is what separated him. The ability to have this massive amount of talent work, which then allowed him to develop a mindset that was a steel fucking trap, mm-hmm. right? And I know we're relating all of this to sports, but I don't, you don't need to be playing sports. You can, you can be doing anything. You have to know who you are. That's step. No, sorry. Sorry. First step number one is love yourself. Mm-hmm. Step number two is know who you are. And then when you know who you are, you know, I'm all into this song, um, "Devil's Eyes" by uh, Hippie Sabotage. Mm-hmm. We golden, baby. We are golden. I'm always golden. I love that. <laughs> I also loved the. The like half second pause to give me a chance to push back on Michael Jordan being the greatest. I'm your generation, man. I'm a little bit older than you, but you know, I was born in 72. There's no debate. If you're going to tell me Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time, we don't need to discuss it anymore because I'm on the same page there. But no, you know, God, some people I thought you were going to push back, but no, I was like, no, I was like, no, yeah, no. Look, I'm dealing with all the not dealing with. I mean, I'm I'm around all these young athletes now that that only know Kobe or LeBron or something, which is great. But you, you didn't live it. You didn't amazing. live it like we lived. You it. didn't feel. You didn't feel MJ, bro. Like, and no. like the aura that was MJ. If, if, there was nothing. You, there was there was no comparison, Elliot. No. I mean, that's the thing. Like now is that okay? LeBron's amazing, but you He's can amazing. start talking about Luka Doncic, and you can start talking about you know uh, you know Kawhi Leonard, whatever. I mean, I'm not even a huge NBA guy anymore, but but there there are a ton of superstars in the league, but there was only one MJ. There's only one MJ, and the only and the closest next outside of basketball is Tom Brady. Okay, yeah, Tom yeah. Brady's the closest next because what he did, and I hate him. I can't I fucking stand Tom Brady. Okay, can't stand him. But what he did this year with Tampa was amazing, and it it we wasn't know. physical. And and look, we're gonna get back to mindset and mental he- mental health here. It was there was nothing physical going on. You added a 43-year-old quarterback and a, and a tight end that hadn't played in three years, right? Like, or whenever the last time Gronk played was. The same coaching staff, the same everything else. So you te- you're you not telling me that Brady is as good physically right now as he was seven years ago in, in the Patriots' huge heyday. Yeah. He's not. He's just not. It's this. Yep, he made ahead. this. He made his mind and his leadership ability and the the uh, the greatest asset outside of time that any of us have, which is the belief in ourselves. He made that, and he took that to Tampa Bay, a team that was what five and eleven the year before. Yeah, I don't want to call him the goat, but he is. I mean, it's, it's the very goat. I don't want to, and, dude. I got no. a funny story with Tom. So I was walking out of the T-Mobile Center um, after a fight, uh, right before he signed with Tampa Bay, before pandemic, January 2020. And I have this rule: I don't like taking a lot of pictures with celebrities. Like, I only take pictures with goats. Like, this is my rule. So, Jordan uh shacks up there right like people who have goat status schwarzenegger you know tyson these kind of you know so i'm walking out of t-mobile and tom is walking in and i see him and i'm walking away from him and i think to myself i'm like god damn i hate that motherfucker and as and then i make a hard right turn right at him and i'm in my head i'm like yeah but he's the best i gotta get a pick (laughs) oh i I He's like, best. He's yeah, best. no, there's no, there's no doubt about it. I like the the goat status stuff too. I, I'm, I'm a picture guy. I take, well, I don't take pictures with everybody, but I just, anyway. All right, so yeah, let's. 
I, I, I want to backtrack a little yeah. bit and, and and then sort of get to how we arrived at at your personal battles, mm-hmm. your mental health challenges. But I'm guessing that, you know, look, if you're an MMA fighter, you're a badass. I, I, there, I, I mean, I suppose there's I suppose it's possible that you, you're not. But I mean, if you're if you're getting in there for MMA, unless it's some kind of publicity stunt, and we see some of those, too. You can fight, you know, you're, you're, you're tough. You're tougher than the fight. average guy. Yeah, I can fight. Yeah. Um, so what were, like, how did you get there? What were the dreams? It, it takes a lot okay. to, to, to step in there and do what you did. All right. So this is, this, this goes all the way back to my childhood. And I have just recently pushed, put this all together, you know, thinking about it. Think so I'm always thinking about how did I get here? You know, like mm-hmm. what, what made me, what made me behave in this way? You know, what made yeah. me feel a certain way? Cause, um, we have to be very aware of our feelings, you know, and I know this is a word that everyone goes way left on and thinks that they're silly. Um, you have to be aware of them. Mm-hmm. You have to realize that your feelings will make you behave a certain way. And then most of the time you have to say, fuck you to them. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the, that your feelings are all on you. There's not a single, you Joel cannot make me feel a certain way. If I, right. It's all on me. They, they are, I'm 100% responsible for my feelings. Mm-hmm. So you have to be aware of them first. Um, like I said, I was born to a uh, black dad who obviously if you if I'm born in 1980, rewind his age 30, you know, 30 some years from there, 1950, uh, he was born 48. So he grew up dead in the middle of civil rights, right? Like when he was not allowed to drink from the same water fountain or use the same bathroom or, you know, back of the bus, all that shit. And then, I mean, we don't have to talk about the atrocities of what a concentration camp looked like. So these were the people that raised me, you know, um, a massive amount of fear. They, they were not safe. And then they put that to me, right? Like, how could they not? At first, they can keep you safe. Little kids, right? Keep everyone safe. You, can, you have children? Oh, yeah. I've got two. Yeah. You can hide them from the world, right? And we do that. We hide them from the, the atrocities and the difficulties of the world. But at some point, the world comes and says hello. You know, and the world started to say hello to me at eight years old. We were moving to a new house. We were building the house. We pull up to the house one day and there's swastikas all over my house, spray painted Niger's. They spelled the word wrong. Um, the first time, you know, at, they figured it out after that. Um, Niger's go home, you know, and all this stuff. Um, and my parents had sunk everything they had into this. So, you know, we weren't going to not live there, you know, um, but this Where was, was my South Jersey. You know, little, little, the sticks of South Jersey, you know, a little town where the high school quarterback was going to be the high school quarterback because his daddy was, his granddaddy was, his big brother was, right? Like everyone knew who the high school quarterbacks are. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have this black Jewish family, white, you know, all mixed move into this town, you know? Um, I'd be allowed to play outside with some kids, but I wasn't allowed in these kids' house. You know, everyone would go in, you know, at night to play video games and Elliot had to go home. Uh, It was very difficult for me. You know, it was very difficult for me and my sister. We were the other and we weren't black. We weren't white. We weren't anything. We were just uh, what it was. I always had martial arts and martial arts was my savior. You know, I would say martial arts gave me that place where um, all the things that your parents, how old are your kids, Joel? 18 and just about 16. So Yeah, so you can't do it for them anymore. You can give them money, but you can't really give them what they need from the world, right? They want nothing to do with you. Yeah. You know, yeah. they want they need peers. You're there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're there. I'm not there yet. My kids still I have 7 and 11. They still love yeah, me. Yeah, sa- savor that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um I the place that I got what I needed from the world was my karate school. Mm-hmm. You know, so everywhere else, no. Walk the halls at school alone hated lunch because I sat by myself, right? The, the, all the times when you think about a school that you love, the halls, recess, lunch, gym, hate it, can't stand it. Why? Because I'm forced by alone. No one will, you know, I'm, I'm be, like, I don't even sit with the dorks because it didn't work. Um, that, that, I mean, that that's a lot to carry. Yeah. As a kid, right? Like, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm going to cut in here because y- you know, I grew up and am Jewish, which, by the way, I mean, is becoming a more difficult thing today in 2021 sure. than it was when I was growing up. But the difference is that that you had color on your skin that at least alerted people that you were different. different. I, I guess that's the best way to put it. it, it yeah, you can't see the Jew. 
right? Like you, when you say, you hi, can, I'm Joel, you know? Right. Like, you can't see it so, as much. I, as much as I assumed everybody thought that the last name Goldberg was Jewish, there I, I meet enough people that are like, oh, you're Jew. You know, so not everybody knew that. So I could still, and I actually, and I just learned this from you. I mean, I grew up until we moved when I was 13 in South Jersey. Oh, um, where? Uh, Morristown, Cherry Hill. Yeah, so I grew up so, in Vineland, Franklinville. Okay, so I didn't experience what you did. Now, I was in a town that was like, <laughs> one, at the time, 1% or 2% Jewish, but I was just like any other white kid. So I didn't carry any of that. Mm -hmm. So you did every single day. I just wanted to cut in because it's like, you talked about that that melting pot, that combination from from your parents and and trying to find your identity I mean, we're all as kids trying to find our identity, but you don't even know where you belong. Yeah, because I don't fit in anywhere. You know, there's no one like me. And and this is it's you know, look, everything in your everything in your life happens for you. It doesn't happen to you. You know, um, we can and and it, it's this duality, right? It's this duality how I see the world. Whereas um my like, for example, and we'll get back to my story in a second. But like my job right now, I, I have made it, right? I have made it out. Like I, I have become successful. Um, mostly, mostly by what I like to say, luck. And what I say luck is I have been given the opportunity to what the luck to be able to work so hard that it actually worked out. Most people don't have that. A lot of people don't have that opportunity, right? Yeah. They just don't have the the opportunity that it doesn't it won't matter how hard they work they will never fucking get out that's what the odds say you know so I what you know, I couldn't control like I had the I know I'm complaining I'm not complaining describing my childhood I had the best parents nobody had better parents than me I had, I had an amazing nuclear home people loved me um, so that that luck is, is luck I had nothing to do with who I was born to you know. Um, when later on in my life that MMA boomed right when I was getting in luck, I, I didn't control that. You know, I didn't control that. I was going to do martial. I was going to fight anyway. I was fighting when it was illegal, <laughs> you know, so luck, just luck here now. And, and then I worked very hard. I don't want to take away hard work. So what is my job? My job is to go sprinkle as much luck dust on as many people as possible. Like just, just sprinkle the luck dust because I was given the opportunity. There's plenty of people that aren't given the opportunity, you know? Um, so we, me and you, we're successful. We need to go equalize out the opportunities for people, not the outcomes, never the outcomes. I don't believe in equalizing out outcomes. Make it so that everyone, regardless, black, Jewish, like we've been taught, no, fuck it. Go, you can do this, right? Like let's present it to them. Now, if I'm actually talking to a kid who's underprivileged, right? If I'm talking to Elliot, at 2020 in 2021 a different elliot who's experiencing the same exact things that i was fuck you dude don't pay attention to that shit let's go i can't tell you that you're unlucky i can't tell you that it's unfair i can't tell you that because if that's your mindset if your mindset is oh woe is me um oh, i'm jewish like you were saying it's worse now probably right you know oh i'm black uh god you know racism it's true fuck yeah it's true it's a hundred percent true it's not even close to being fair what you gonna do? It's your life. You get one shot at this. You wanna work? You wanna get out? Let's go. That's just how I see it, you know? Yeah, it I mean it look, it makes sense. I, I you know, and again, I keep saying this, you don't you don't figure that over out overnight. You figure mm -hmm. it out over time, and then when you do figure it out, you pass it on to others. Pass that's what on. leadership that's what yes. leadership is all about. I wrote about that in my book. I mean, I think one of the most important elements to any successful culture is passing on what you have learned. That's the only way that you continue that culture and, and, and pass it on from generation to generation. So at what point did you realize that you needed help or how long okay. were you carrying this? It's really, I'm sure it was easy. I might be wrong. You can correct me. I mean, I'm sure it was easy to be like, you know, I'm in the, I'm in the ring. I'm dominating. I'm tough. I could do no, this. I'm strong enough. First. It gets okay. worse first. So my the summer gets better and worse. Okay. So the summer in between my junior and senior year, um, jujitsu wasn't around yet. Brazilian jujitsu, like the Gracie family, the people who founded MMA, um, it wasn't. It was very scarce. The people that I was doing karate with started it. They showed me a little. They beat me up, and then they showed me a little bit of it. And I, I don't know, I learned a little bit. 
jujitsu, you know, and I go back to, you know, my senior year of high school. Um, I was a late bloomer. So I like lost a lot of weight, you know, got a little fitter, you know, um, I started talking about this jujitsu stuff and some, some wrestlers heard about it, right? Because they're very similar. They're both grappling right on the mat. And they were like, man, we'll beat your ass. And I was like, okay, let's find out. You know, we didn't punch or anything. We just wrestled, we grappled to see who could make the other person give up. And I won. And they were like state champs. Like they were cool, popular, some, you know, so now I win. People hear about it, you know, or pe- and some people saw it. And then... And now you got some credibility. Elliot starts to build some popularity. A girl kissed yeah. me maybe for the first time, right? And that changes your fucking life, <laughs> um, you know? So I now start associating winning fights or, or w- fighting with safety. Not just popularity, safety. Friends, people will accept me. The world will love me. Okay, I'm going to fight in the UFC. Literally, like two days after that, I'm like, I'm going to fight in the UFC. And I start telling everyone. Because like, if you know, if I said I was going to play Major League Baseball, they'd be like, Elliot, you can't hit the fucking ball. What are you talking about? The UFC was something nobody knew. But it was kind of this cool thing, right? Unheard of, underground, yada, yada, you know? So, and then it just takes off. I start winning. I start getting very, very good at jiu-jitsu. My, it grows. I know this devil's, I know this demon of fear is still inside me. But I'm beating it down with beat with winning, Right? And then you get to the big show, right? You get to the big show. When you get to the big show, man, that cage door don't lie. <laughs> you know, that cage door, it shuts behind you and it doesn't lie. And I have more than just winning a fight on my hands. I have like my whole acceptance and, and, and place in the world on my hands. And that becomes very scary and it halts me. It, the fear of that. Sometimes I fight okay and sometimes I don't fight okay. And you know, when I'm going to get to the UFC. And then, you know, you don't see a world title belt behind me. So I was never a world champion. Failed, right? Failed at the goal. And with fighting, when you fail at fighting, you don't make a lot of money. You, don't, you barely make any money when you don't fail at fighting. Um, it's not the NBA and the NFL. Everyone is not Conor McGregor. Most of us are not. Um, so now how else am I going to beat this demon down? You know, the, like this demon is still inside of me excuse me and uh you know i I retired in 11 opened the schools immediately you know like bought in and then we built big schools everything was going well but i was running from this fear i was running from him i was not entering the arena and i wasn't even know about entering the arena um and he came high he came to say hello you know he came to say hello five four years later five years later and uh then then you know that's where this whole process started and i had to what I like to say, walk into the fire. I had to go meet him. I had to go say hello to him and see what he was really going to bring. What, what, what does, what, the, what is the fear, Elliot? What is the fear? Walk head first into it. And when you go in, when you go all the way in, you actually get to get out. So did a couple questions. Did, did the fear? So, I mean, did fighting hit, basketball? Hit, did fighting yeah, basketball? Hit, Hitler's coming again, and and they're going to hang you from a fucking tree, is is what the fear was. Hitler's coming again, right? So what are you going to do? What are you going to do when Hitler comes again? Because you're not safe, right? You're never fucking safe. And Elliot, watch your back. That was what my dad still tells it to me today, bro. Uh, when I was going, I went to Vegas last week for a fight. I told you, right? The Vegas commission quarantines you the whole time. You show up, you're not allowed to leave the goddamn hotel. My dad's like, Elliot, be careful. I'm like, dad, I'm going to be locked in a goddamn hotel. Like, like, I'm not allowed to leave. There's nothing to be careful of. But he can't get over that, right? He can't get over not being able to, to go trick-or-treating because it wasn't safe. He can't get over how many times mm-hmm. like he's getting pulled over and wondering what's going to fucking happen to you on this time. You know, it, it never went bad for him. But you know, so this my is, grandparents, this was everything, this is everything. everything dating to your childhood and, and is, before your yeah. childhood and before my child, dude, you went to my grandparents' house. There's food. There was food in the house from 1979 and 1995 because you have to be able, you know, my grandparents made it out. They had plenty of money to live. My grandma used to, I called her my Baba. There was a farm because I lived in the, in the farm and she used to make us crawl on our stomachs in the farm and steal cucumbers. She already bought 10 cucumbers earlier that day, but because who fucking knew, right? Like 
who knew? And like, I don't fault her for it because it was just her existence, right? Yeah. Like you, 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 there was, there was, you were not fucking safe. And that's my life. That was my life. And I had to learn how to not get out of that. That was some work. So that all manifested itself in, I mean, you went from the, the, the kid with no identity, no group, isolated to, you know, you, you, you get, a, you, you suddenly get instant credibility. And now everyone is looking at you like, Hey man, th this guy is really cool. He just, he just beat the toughest dudes in the school. Right. And now that's sort of masking what you were dealing with and you could let it out in those fights and, mm -hmm. and, and you're the badass and you're the man. And then, uh, or along the way, it's manifesting itself with panic attacks and anxiety and, and no one can live like that. No, or you have right. to figure out how to live like that. They would come up even, even during my career, like they would come up. Right. And then they would go away. You know, I, I whatever, because anxiety, you have to understand no, nobody has anxiety when they're in a fucking fight, you fight, <laughs> you, have, you know, you, you have anxiety when you're doing nothing. And you're like, oh my God, what's wrong? And you're, that's a panic attack because uh, nothing is wrong. So your body has the, gets the flight or fight response. And you're like, why am I having this response? If you're about to get into a fight and you have a, the flight or fight response, you just go fucking fight, <laughs> right? You know, you just fight and then, then it's, it's over. So it, uh, it masks itself. After fighting, it, it wasn't masking itself anymore. And, and, and this demon you know, that was, I like to call him my best friend now, you know, because mm -hmm. he's my homie. We're, we're homeboys. So I don't like him all the time, just like any real best friend. Um, and the demon is the, the, anxiety. the anxiety. I still get it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I still get it. I still, my hands shake and my, I get nervous and I say, hi, I say, hello. Mm -hmm. I don't ask him to go away. I say, how, how long are you going to last with me? And I say, you will not stop me from doing what I'm going to do today. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know what I'm doing today. I have, this is my day and we are going to do it. So you can hang out. That's cool. I'll talk to you later. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, sp I talk to myself. I talk to myself all the fucking time. Nothing wrong with that. And you're embracing mm -hmm. What is there? Uh, I, I know we're going to be limited. On, well, we're not limited on time. I just know that we're going to go and go and go because you, you go and go. I, I, I got to, yeah, we're, we're good. But you got a flight a to time. catch and I still have some business I want to take care of. So let yeah. me get to my baseball themed questions yeah. uh, in your life. Now, what's the biggest home run that you've hit? The biggest home run, Oh man, my kids, I'm still mm -hmm. working on it. You know, I'm still working on it. It was, it was so cool yesterday, man. Um, my kid, uh, he loves sports, you know, and he's at this basketball camp and I have two of them. I have one that's this freak fucking athlete. It's stupid. My, my oldest picks him. He's seven. That's a big age gap, right? Like he's almost eight. So it's a three-year age gap. Eight-year-olds can't hang with 11-year-olds, right? My, my eight-year-old can. So when my kids play like two-on-two, -two, Kanan, my oldest, picks my, his brother and they smash people. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, my other one's the opposite. He had to, he has to work hard. He has to work really hard and he does it. He's out there practicing two hours a day and we, and he has, he's my mini. So he has all of this anxiety, right? He has all of this. He's just like me. And, you know, uh, a coach at basketball camp came up to him who played in college, coached college for 15 years. Like, Hey, I think like if we work, if you keep this up, you could probably, you know, you could probably make, a college team and like play college ball and he goes and he goes man yeah, he comes home he's all excited he goes man dad uh, you know he's talking about his mindset he goes dad where did you learn all of this mindset stuff and i was like oh dude i just learned from from fucking it up you know i fucked it up in my life in my career you know i didn't have any of it so now it's my job to go sprinkle some of that sprinkle some of that knowledge you know so my, my kids man i'm still rounding the bases bro <laughs> i love it well you never stop yeah but, and it's the answer that you gave to your kid, you, your mistakes or your demons or your battles are victories if you learn from them. So I, I love this question. What's your biggest swing and miss? And what did you learn from it? My biggest swing and miss? I've never swung and missed. Hmm. I'm, I'm right here right now talking to you. I shouldn't be anywhere else. If I would have swung and hit, we I don't know what that, what that would have done. What would that have done in my life? Where would that word, where would that have put me? Right. It could change your, the, the could change your whole life we you see it all the time and so, so it was never it was never a swing and miss because it, it, it led 
it led to who you are. I mean, yeah. it was, I had, all it was I do is hit, all I do is hit home runs. You know, like you like it's not even when you miss, it's a home run. Like, and that's just my mentality. Like, right. I, I don't regret anything that happens to me in my life because uh, yeah, again, once you start regretting, things start happening to you. Mm -hmm. Once things happen to you, you become a victor. You cannot be the victim. I'm sorry, you cannot be the victim of your life. You must be the victor of your life. So let's go. You cannot think that you swung and missed. The last baseball themed question is what my book was about, small ball, big results. In the baseball world, we get so enamored with the home run. Mm -hmm. And I know it's small ball. I, I love it. sports. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I watched I watched the Royals here, traveled with them and all that. You know, small market team win a world championship by by bunting and playing good defense and all the things that aren't as sexy, but but to me they're really beautiful. So that's what I wrote the book on. Small ball, the the little things that add up to the home runs, and you practice them every day. I can tell just from from your discipline, not in terms of training, but in terms of mindset. What is small ball to you? Small balls. I wake up and I have and I meditate right away. Okay, I wake up and I meditate. After I meditate. I thank the universe. I say, thank you. I'm not, I'm not a very religious person. I believe that there's something greater than this. So I say, thank you to it. I don't care if it's, I don't care which God it is. It could matter not to me. Um, I say, thank you to it. After I say, thank you to it. Uh, I repeat uh, the Marcus Aurelius quote that I have tattooed on my arm right here. The impediment of action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way quote unquote, the obstacle is the way after I do that. I make, I recite the four agreements to myself. I will be impeccable with my word today. I will take nothing personally. I make no assumptions. I hate the word best. Um, it says always do your best. I like the word skillful. So I say, I, I will always do the most skillful. I always look for the most skillful action. After that, I repeat my I am's every single day. And then I get up and I say, let's fucking go, Elliot. Small ball at night after my day. I get on my knees, you know, I hold my meditation beads, you know, again, and I say thank you and I love you to all of the people that touched my life that day, you know, yeah. every single person that touched my life that I love and I know will love me for everything that I am and everything that I am not. When I say I'm not, everything, all of my failures, all of my shortcomings, you know, all of the things that I did unskillfully that, unskillfully that day and those people still choose to love me. So um that's that's how i play small ball all right we've got a little bit of time left not a lot four final questions as we round the bases we'll, we'll hit some different things here first one i love it in the questionnaire we asked you what, what's something that people might be surprised about and the answer was that you're a softy so oh. I, I i mean there's probably just this assumption that if you're a fighter that you've that well of course you're tough but that somehow that that, that keeps you from being a, a good guy or a softy tell me about being a softy i'm just emo i'm emotional you know, I, I like hugs, you know, I like hugs. I like to touch, I like to touch people appropriately. Um, you know, I'm working with, a t I'm working with a couple of female fighters right now. I give them hugs. I tell them I love them like in a non-sexual way. Right. I tell my male friends that I love them, you know, often, very often. I love you. Um, and you know, at night it's not, it's not my wife who wants to like have me put their hand on you know i don't like don't touch me when i fucking sleep but when we're laying there i like to touch you know um watching tv or whatever my kids all the time give them hugs love you uh, i'm a softy i'm an emotional softy but i'm very aware of it so i'm i'm very aware of what i need so that's a, an important piece again this is feelings right it's it's on me to meet my 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 feelings and, and my needs all right, second question as we round the bases, you decided to get back in the ring. What was that like? I didn't get in the ring. I, I went back to competing at jiu-jitsu. So oh, jiu-jitsu, okay. Yeah, it wasn't fighting. I did not fight okay. again, I, uh, you okay. know. Um, what was that like? Man, I, I fixed my mindset, right? I figured it out. I was able – I beat some world champions, and I had never beaten a world champion before as a young man in the prime of my career, physically the strongest. And I did that post-kids uh, – seven businesses right like seven schools with 150 employees where you don't where shit comes up and you can't go train you can't put that first you know but it all came down to what was going on like the training that i did between these two years okay third question let's talk about that i mean you, you you've got these businesses seven locations mm -hmm. i'm sure that uh the reflection 
upon you. And and so everyone that's coming through there is getting that love and getting that motivation and, try to. and getting that attention and, and, and trying to be open-minded and treating people inclusively in a way that you didn't always have growing up. What, what's the secret to, what has been your secret to success in terms of business? What you just said. Oh, what's the secret to business? Oh, core values. What will you lose friends and money over? Right. What, 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 what will you fucking die? What mountain will you die on? What are your core values? And then once you have, once you know what they are, don't go put them on the wall. Don't put your core values on the wall. You, you know, I like to say if not, not somebody who walked in yesterday or a month ago, but if you go into one of my students, you know, one of our students, um, and say, and ask them, Hey, what are the core values of the business? You know, we have four and they're four words. Actually, if they, they're not going to recite the words, but they better start describing them right mm -hmm. without them being on the wall because you have to act it you know you have to put your money where your goddamn mouth is so um what will you lose friends and money over i love that all right final question it's the walk off i'll end on a serious note because it's important yeah but look i mentioned it at the top of the the podcast everybody's going through stuff you may not know it but they are and you don't have to be in the ring or you don't have to be in jujitsu. You don't have to be, uh, it doesn't matter what you are in any age and, and any background too. So what, what's your advice to that, to that person that maybe is listening to this and, and is dealing with anxiety is dealing with panic attacks. And, and that is only ramped up with the pandemic and being yeah. isolated. I mean, everybody knows someone, if not themselves, what, what's your, I know it's not an easy fix either, but what's your advice? First of all, somebody loves you. Somebody loves you, okay? Somebody loves you. Please realize that somebody fucking loves you and start from there, okay? Realize, number two, every single storm runs out of rain. It always does. The storm runs out of rain. The question of how to help start getting yourself out, take all of the focus off you. Go help somebody else. When you help somebody else, I don't care what it is, help them move, do, do something. Okay. Take that now as a win. Remember what that felt like. Go help another person. Okay. You'll get another win. Go help a third person. Now you'll have three wins, right? You, you, you just got three wins. So build on the three wins. And then look, I'm a fan of doing hard shit. I'm a fan of exercising in some way, very, very difficultly because it does something to the body where it gets it out, right? anxiety when my kid starts i told you my, my oldest has you know anxiety when when we can't talk our way out of it i make him run make him run sprints i make him do push-ups i make him do squat jumps till he's so fucking tired that he has no time to pay attention to the anxiety it dissipates mm. so it's not about wondering why you have anxiety or what it feels like say hello to it say fuck you to it and then get to work powerful words powerful message you know that and i I've learned a lot. Not, I, I've learned about a lot about just living in this moment because you, you really, you said something I hadn't heard before that this is the most important thing right now. It's about to not be the most important thing because I know that you got to get going on to the next important thing. Yeah, but, but I just want to, but, and that's it. And, and you move on and make the next thing important. I want to let everybody know that the website is elliotmarshall.com because that's where you'll find out everything. E L I O T. So one L one T and then Marshall, as, as you would expect, Elliot Marshall.com. Um, he's got the podcast. He's got the book. He's a, obviously a, a, an amazing motivational speaker. Um, and, and you'll learn everything there. So Elliot, I'm, I'm so grateful for your, your time today, your inspiration. I didn't know I was talking to a, a fellow South Jersey native. That's South a long, Jersey long time Jew. ago. We're both South Jersey yeah. Jews. So South Jersey <laughs> Jews. Uh, who knew? You know, I learned something every day. Yeah, man. Every, every time I do this podcast, uh, you, you were the tough one. I was not. But I think we've, we've, we've both made it in the sense that we have this ability to help other people's lives. We don't have to judge, right? We don't, we don't have to, no. you know, we don't need to put. No, it's not a competition. Yeah, it's not a competition. The only person you need to compete with is you right? Like you, we're not playing. We didn't start with the same deck of cards. So how are we going to try to compare the game, right. right? You have a different deck of cards. I have a different deck of cards. Play your own game, you know, play your own game. I appreciate you, brother. Uh, yeah, man. So great to be able to visit with you again, elliotmarshall.com. Thanks for the time today. Thanks for having me on, Joel. I appreciate it, man.